this is another fantastic interview that I've lined up for you and with somebody very special who is an essential integral part of the journey of rationalism and skepticism in India. He doesn't live in India any longer, but he is still the founder and the main driving force behind Rationalists International. Hey everybody, welcome back to Rationable Interviews. Sanal or Mr. Edomaraku, <laughs> welcome to Sanal, Rational. you can call me Sanal. <laughs> okay, Sanal it is. Welcome finally to Rationalist. To, hi, I'm almost counting myself as a part of your organization now. I want to be a part of it for sure. But welcome to Rationable Interviews. So where are you based right now? You don't have to give any specific location, but around where are you based at this point? I live in Finland now. For the last 10 years, I live in Finland. Based in Finland, I travel across and uh, yeah, I keep on doing what I've been doing, appearing on televisions or giving podcasts or interviews or online meetings and managing the Indian Rationalist Association as well as the Rationalist International, comparatively in a safer source. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So here you went on voluntary exile to Finland. So uh, how did that happen? How did that work out? And this is a story I know to some extent, but I want you to go into all the details that you can, because this is a very important story that we should all know about. I think, I don't know whether one can call my moving to Finland as an exile. That's how most of the media I mean, reported, like BBC and CNN and all said that it's a self self-imposed exile is how they said it. Yeah, but it could be also. I still work in India, but not physically. I'm not there. The, I've been active on Indian television. I've been active on Indian public scene for several decades now. We have been having meetings and meetings in uh, universities and in public places and organizing things. And on. once the televisions opened up back in 1990s, late 1990s, Instead of moving from meeting place to meeting place, we moved to television studios, to television studios and started appearing everywhere in the national media. Virtually all national television channels, we have been regularly, I've been on something like 150 to 200 television appearances per year. That was the kind of television programs I've been doing. Challenging and, I mean, debunking, if you want to call it that way. Most of what was presented in the Indian media as a miracle or paranormal activities or religious bigotry or everything, I mean, that we have to counter. I've been active on televisions and that has provoked a lot of people. But generally, I use a very civilized language. I don't use any language of hatred or anything that it was very difficult to tackle me or corner me if anybody wanted to do that. And I was so, so active on televisions. And this has been a problem for a lot of people. and But finally, they could corner me on one point. That was in 2012. Yeah, the, most of the time, as India is mainly a Hindu majority country, most of the, the supernatural claims or miracle claims are coming from the Hindu side. I've been regularly active against all these gurus and their claims and everything I was there. But this time in Mumbai, in 2012, there was a claim in Mumbai church mm -hmm. that the statue of Jesus there is weeping. Ah, yes. I mean, it, like, like Mary weeping, that's known everywhere. I mean, that such claims are there. And it was exposed and explained everywhere. But this was a very special case. Mm -hmm. This was a statue standing on a wall in front of the church. And water was dripping but not one or two drips. It was dripping down and people were collecting the droplets in mm. bottles from the feet. And a lot of water. It was just keeping on coming. Which church and was it again? That was Ville Parle Catholic Church in the Mumbai Ville Parle. Ah, okay. okay. I lived in Delhi at that time. And now most of these kind of claims uh, I mean, would come on television and I would be asked to comment on that. And I was naturally, I was asked to comment on that. I was sitting in the Delhi studio and the miracle was shown. The reporters were there and they were showing it. It looked like 
something very fishy and strange. That was my first impression seeing the clippings. Water was dripping, dripping and dripping down <laughs> continuously. People were collecting. And then the local people have been claiming very interesting things. That was also coming in the television, that uh, somebody who had cancer was suddenly cured. And uh, somebody had a, a blurry in his vision. He could uh, see now. Ailments are getting cured. And also there was a mentioning in the TV report that they have apl applied for a miracle status in Vatican. In, okay. in a Catholic church, to get it established as a pilgrimage place, they have to formally get approval from Vatican and they have applied for it. And I looked at the background and I found that similar claims were made in some other churches also in Mumbai. They applied for miracle status, but somehow it was not sanctioned at that time because there was some public criticism or opposition or meantime it stopped, whatever it is. I said, come on, this is a simple thing. A statue cannot fly. It's okay. common sense. If you yeah. believe, yes, you can believe anything. But it's just common sense. It's no scientific explanation to go it that mm. the statue was not crying. It could be some water trapped somewhere. Maybe it has a crack on his head. Some rainwater has fallen in. Maybe they have manipulated something. I cannot say it's sitting in Delhi, what it is. But the church authorities, if they have an open mind, instead of calling it a miracle, they should just apply their critical mindset go and look around and try to see what it was. Exactly. That's yeah. what I suggested. Was this clear that was, that was coming out of the eyes, his tears? Yeah. But the, the focusing was given on the feet. Water was dripping from oh. the feet. Okay. That was, that, that was how it was. So the, one could not see the eyes because it's a tall statue, something like five, six feet tall statue. I and see. around straight to our side, one can see the feet and feet, the water was dripping. There is no other source one can see. And it was a kind of a heated argument. I They took it very serious. And they said that, come on, this is a real miracle and we all are experiencing it. The first person who experienced it was not even a Christian, but a Hindu. I said, that doesn't make any difference because people who want to believe, they would believe no matter where it is and who it is. So why don't you just, just try to study it? instead of just blindly taking it as a miracle. So they said, come on, this is a miracle. And if you want, you are telling about evidences for everything, and you are sitting in Delhi and saying that it's not a miracle, mm. why don't you come and study the whole thing? And if it's not a miracle, explain it. That's an open, friendly challenge. I said, if you permit that I can come there, and I can verify it, and if your people won't attack me for <laughs> studying it, then I can come over there. Uh -huh. I don't have I don't have any prejudice, but you can also probably find it, okay. And it ended there because I clearly said that look there, but for a statue there is there there are no tear glands, and humans excrete a lot of water by sweating, by I mean crying, by saliva, urination, lot of things. But a statue would not do that. It's very simple. Ask a little child and he would understand it. When you're blind with your Believe only you think that it's a miracle. Okay. They invited me after, I mean, that, that was on the 3rd of March. I remember these dates because I mean, this was very important in my life. And uh, seven days later, they suggested that I could go to Mumbai and they can, I can personally verify it. And the date was fixed for 10th of March, 2012. I, yes, I decided to go over there and I took a friend along with me who is a civil engineer. I thought if I could not understand what was happening. There is, this is a cement statue and one may be able to understand it better. I should get a little expert support, I thought. Together we have gone and once I reached there, it was very interesting. I'm narrating the story because it's very interesting in a way how it all happened. When I reached there, the first thing that I noticed was some 200 to 300 people were standing in front of the statue and a prayer was going on. The priest was reading from Bible mm -hmm. about miracles of Jesus. And then people were kneeing and then they're standing up. And then after the prayer, then I waited outside this scene. And after the prayer, the somebody distributes this water to people, take it in their palm. Many people immediately lick it and some droplets are given to everybody. People lick it and drink it. And it was brought to me also without noticing who I was. I did not take it in my hand, mm -hmm. but 
I collected it in a small vessel which I had. Uh, my friend immediately sent it for chemical examination. That was the first way of handling this thing. So after that, I didn't go alone. I went with the television crew. Wonderful. The television, uh, yeah. I talked to TV9, one of the major channels which has uh, first spoke, one of the biggest channels in Mumbai. The crew was with me and uh, they have been recording the whole thing. And then the priest comes to me and after the prayer, I said, I am Sanal. I came because of your invitation and you have given this time. The priest comes to me and say that the king gives me immediately a small hammer. I don't take it. But I said, why, why do you give me this hammer? You said there could be water trapped inside. I said, that was one of the possibilities that I suggested. Oh, okay, his position was, if it was uh, water trapped inside, you can smash the statue and see if there was any water inside. I immediately understood what was the intention. Yeah. I mean, ima imagine a moment I take this hammer in my hands, a hundred photographs would be taken. And if I smash it somewhere or crack or even touch it, I will be seen immediately as a crazy person smashing their statue. And that's, they were making several possibilities trap me down. Then somebody said, you want to dig down the bottom? You can even dig down. Then what happens? It will fall down. Yes. So some, somebody brings a pickaxe. I said, no, I don't want anything. Hmm. So I, instead, without touching anywhere, I just looked the whole thing. And one of the first things that I noticed, probably, as you asked rightly, hmm. the water perhaps was not coming from the ice. Because it looked dry. That's a primary observation. I didn't touch on anything. Okay, when I just, this is touching a wall, half wall on the outskirts of the church. I go inside. And there I found three, quickly one small thing. Just behind the statue on the wall, there is fresh algae, fresh green algae growing. And that looked fresh. But it was going towards one side, one direction. And, and where it ends, I went up to a corner of the wall, and it ends there. It's common sense to understand that apparently some water source was there, and water is coming there. It's not from one or two days. Occasionally, rains were there, and this water presence has given a possibility to grow this, this green-colored fungus growing there. So I went to the possible source place, the corner, and then I found that there was a drainage line, an open drainage line covered with the stones. I mean, cut stones that I mean, used for that. And I, I didn't have even a gloves or anything, but out of curiosity, I just opened it. It was stinking smell all around. It was a drainage line coming from the toilet. Oh. And <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> and this was a point where... This would go to the city line. Outside is the city line. And uh -huh. this was the connecting point where it will be draining down to the city line. But there was a blockage. So the water was blocked there. And it has no way to go. Naturally, when water is blocked and it has no way to go, it will go through small pores anywhere. Capillary action. Simple thing. And it went through the cemented wall. Wherever it could possibly reach, it has tried to reach, but it found one outlet. That was the statue outside. On the statue, there was a, a nail on the feet. Jesus, the statue, there are five holy wounds. Yeah. The nails were on, on the feet and the hands, and, and this nail above the feet, there was a hole. And the water climbed through this. And since there was a hole, Apparently, I thought water could be draining down from there. That was my primary observation. But mm -hmm. how would I confirm it? I mean, clean my hand and went outside. And then I touched above the nail line. Mm -hmm. My assumption was correct. It was completely dry. From the nail down, water was dripping. It was not coming from the eyes, but from the nail on the feet. Ah. And it was actually the clogged toilet drainage water. And that was what they have been serving to people as holy water. Later, I know that okay. the, there was diarrhea in the whole area. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. 
This was it. But I, it was very hard. I mean, it very simple and little humorous at that time. Mm. But I understood the potential danger at that moment because I could not say it publicly. There was a crowd, a devout crowd waiting outside. Very curious because everybody knew my criticism. People knew that I was coming. And there could be, I mean, normal people, but there could be some angry, fanatic people also amongst them. So my expectation was correct. When I came out, they said, what did you find? I said, I did not find anything. I have to, I've made some observations. I have to, I've taken a lot of photographs. I've taken small videos and I have seen the whole thing. And like, because already I knew what was happening. I only wanted to get a confirmation from the chemical analysis of the water. Also, mm-hmm. That was a reconfirmation about my observation. So they said, I should explain it there and then. Otherwise, I would not be allowed to go. Mm. And that was the stressing point that I would not be allowed to go from there. I smelt danger. And uh, then I looked around and uh, all the people were sitting on chairs there. But I immediately located two, three, four people back holding plastic chairs in their hands. That means they were the people to attack me the moment I say something. So I said, I don't have to say anything. I will just go now. No, you are not allowed to go. They stopped me. It was a plan to invite me, to get me into a trap there. That was the plan. That is why the hammer was brought and that was the pickaxe was brought and then everything was pre-planned. So I said, okay, I should explain to the crowd what I have seen. I should not speak something else later on television. Mm. Okay. I thought I should use this opportunity. I thought of Mark Antony, how one could twist a speech at one point. And I started speaking to these people. It was a little tricky. I first explained that according to your belief, miracles happen. But all claims are not accepted by Vatican because it wants a kind of a verification and there should be devil's advocate. And only after that, they would approve a miracle, which means all claims are not miracles, even according to your faith. Indeed. And also many times, the claims that are coming from different sources without understanding what it is, could mm. not be miracles. Then I went and explained the one miracle in Northern India, in Himachal Pradesh, where mm. fire was coming from water for a long time. Long time during the Mughal Empire's time and all, it was seen as a devil by some people. Some people found it as a holy thing. Now we know that this is an inflammable natural glass mm. getting released, but still that is worshipped as a goddess. Agni. Jwala Mukhi. It's a goddess and people are, it's a pilgrimage there. Yeah. I ask people, do you know about this story? But it's not a miracle we all know. But for mm. many people, it's a miracle. Mm-hmm. So then another example, I took examples from other cultures and other religions. I took the example of another thing in Mumbai some years back, there was seawater turning sweet. Again, I have been there studying the whole thing and found that it was a city drainage going into the water and water currents brought it and that was near a mosque and they thought it's a miracle of Allah. But it was not. Now everyone knows that it was not. So people, now I found the elder ladies and all, they are shaking their head and I'm in approval. And then I also I spoke about the Indian constitution where we have to have a critical spirit of inquiry and spirit of uh, reform and that's the duty of everybody. I mm. started speaking and the priest was getting annoyed and unhappy and he said enough you can go now because he didn't want me to continue with this speech but that was a moment I just almost ran to the car <laughs> sat there and uh, escaped from there but that was not planned by them they wanted me to be trapped there and once I moved from there I understood that there could be a danger but the television channels were very happy because they got enough fine clippings they said we are going to have a big show in the evening we would invite the representatives of the church also. And you could explain what you found. I said, wonderful. Prime time <laughs> in Mumbai. And that was perhaps and seen by a lot of people. And I was given 10 minutes to explain what I found. I explained the whole thing with pictures and it's small images and everything that I had. And then a debate for 30 minutes with uh, four representatives or five representatives from the church at one side. And I alone on the other side. And the church, the priest has come and their lawyer, very interestingly, a Supreme Court lawyer, oh. on behalf of the church joins. 
Yeah. It's, it's, a, it was a very interesting event. And uh, but the moment we all sat in one room, and the moment I said, as I explain, this was not a miracle, but this was drainage water. Mm-hmm. It's not your mistake, I said. But that moment, one of these people tried to jump on me to attack me physically. Mm. It was difficult to continue this program. So then I was taken to another room. The debate continues. It shows that we all were sitting in different windows, but I alone was sitting in this lawn room <laughs> so that the, I, they, they won't attack me. I didn't experience such a thing in televisions ever before. And yeah. they were so furious and making so, stranger. Before Goswami turned up on TV. <laughs> <laughs> in, anyway, but even I don't go so I mean, physical attacks won't be there. I was seeing many his programs also many times. Of course, he has a position and he argues for that, and you can counter it also. Yeah. But this was different. This was physical attack. Then the bishop calls to the mm-hmm. channel, and I said, miracles do not happen. If you don't understand, you say it's a miracle. Yeah. I would say rather, I don't understand. Then I try to study it. If I understand, I will explain it. Otherwise, say that this is a phenomenon we are yet to understand. That's how we should see it. That was my position. So the bishop wanted to stop the program. Mm. And he called the television channel and asked them to stop it. The channel was courageous enough. And they said, no, we cannot stop the program. But you could join the program and counter what he said. Fair enough. The bishop agreed. And the auxiliary bishop of Mumbai joins the program. So it becomes a very different level of discussion. And so he took it. Of course, till he came, all these people claimed that it was a miracle. I said, water was climbing up the wall. No, water won't climb up. It will go down only. That's the law of gravity. Gravitation is a law of God and water goes down only. It never goes up. Okay. I said, ask your, if somebody has a child who studies in the fourth standard, mm. there is a lesson on, on capillary action. How plants are getting water. I mean, all these kind of things I tried to explain. So anyway, the bishop joined the program and he took a very different position. He said, this could be explained by physics. I said, fair enough. But miracles would happen. Ah. I said, there is a serious dispute on that point. I would not say that miracles would happen. There are many things that you don't understand. He said, immediately. So there should be a scientific attitude, scientific approach to the whole thing. The bishop immediately twisted the whole thing. He said, in fact, what is your right to speak about science? We should speak about science as Catholic Church because we are responsible for the scientific growth in Europe and science has developed because of our patronage. Uh Aha. That was a statement. (laughs) (laughs) This was a very interesting program. I don't know whether the whole thing is available on on video uh, because part of the God which is on the YouTube but he asked me, are you laughing? I said, look, I asked him whether do you, whether he believed in exorcism. He said he would not believe in such things. I said, unfortunately, a Pope believes. The Pope had a meeting of exorcist priests in Poland some months back. He said, that's a lie. I said, come on. There was a report in New York Times. And I was myself in Poland immediately after that. And I know about it. And I know the first hand information in front of me. Your church believes in exorcism. There are experts for exorcism. Okay, he said, for an argument, I would accept that. In fact, that is true also. Then I said, what is happening in exorcism? You're invoking the spirit of the dead people, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the belief of exorcism. So the conversation was going in a very different way. Then I said, here's the point I want. If your church believes in exorcism, I would like your help. Get two witnesses to counter your argument about how you supported science. He said, what exactly you are telling? Come to the point. I said very clearly, the two spirits you have to, I don't believe in spirit, but since you believe in spirit and you can invoke spirits, two spirits I want you to invoke are of Galileo Galilei and Leonardo Bruno. Let them vouch for me here, whether you promoted science or persecuted scientists. (laughs) That was a little long way to reach there, but the... (laughs) Cameraman understood the joke and other people in this studio understood. They all started laughing. Yeah. The bishop did not get it initially. But after a minute, he understood. Then he was so furious and he walked off the program so angrily. And he said, you're insulting the Christian faith and you're, I mean, very hard words. And he goes. And that turned everything. And I could not come out of the studio after that. 
when the program was over, the head of the channel invites me for a dinner. <laughs> I yeah. said, come on, I have a plan for eating outside. No, you cannot go outside. There are people with staff and sticks waiting outside for you. Oh, wow. Literal witch hunt. Yeah. And I, I said, oh, what? This studio is not in the main city also. It's far away. No, they're, they're supposed to be angry Catholics attacking you. Yeah. And they want to kill you outside. They're waiting there. It looks strange. It's not, nobody knows even where the channel's actual studio would be. And it's not in the main city without, uh, and then some of the cameramen came and said that, look, I know the people outside. I looked, peeped over the wall. And they found that some of them are known goons in the city. They are beating boys. You pay money and they go and beat people. Okay. They are the kind of people. And they were brought in vans by the church. So they are waiting for you, pretending to be Catholics, going to attack me. And we waited two, three hours inside. They were not leaving. They were just waiting. There was only one gate. So later... They opened backside, a small, what you call a, a gate, which is meant for garbage taking and all. And I came out and the taxi was waiting for me. And I went to my hotel and I changed my flight time and left for Delhi mm -hmm. uh, one or two hours earlier. I came to know that my flight was known and there were people waiting for me at the airport also. But before that, I could leave. That was taken that serious. And the next day, there were reports that there were cases filed against me in so many police stations for blasphemy. Oh, not right. one. 27 complaints in different police stations in different Wait, parts of seven. Maharashtra. Means if I could come out from one arrest, another case is waiting for me. And this law is a very interesting law, Article 295A in the Indian Penal Code. Yeah. Came from during the British time, which says that a person with uh, malicious intention, if he hurt the senti religious sentiments of somebody, he can be arrested. It's cognizable and non-bailable. And they're still and there. This they're law is still there. And it does not need judicial interference to arrest a person. You don't have to make a report and get the sanction of the courts to arrest a person. But the police officer, if he is pleased, he can arrest the person and keep him in his custody up to six months and can get extension also. And it's a very hard law. This was used once against Periyar E.B. Ramaswamy in 1960s. And the case was registered and he came out of it. That's another story. But anyway, I decided to fight this case. I, mean, I thought it's a great opportunity because this law should go. Absolutely. One of, one of the possibilities is that if you have any law, the British law of the criminal laws in India, that's very old, 1857, they made these laws and it made, it got some amendments and all. But when the Indian constitution came in 1950, India did not make a new criminal law. The Indian penal code that existed was adapted by the new government. At that time, it's an established system. And one agreement was that if any law becomes violative of the fundamental rights, that law becomes null and void. So that with that guarantee, this was taken as India's criminal law. Back in 1960s, somebody has made public interest litigation against this case. But that was not a well-prepared case. And that was dismissed by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So there is no possibility to go for another public interest litigation. But if I am a victim of this law, then I can challenge it. And probably I will win and stop this law. That was my point. So we made a defense committee and set of lawyers got prepared. And we made an international campaign and collected all material of how this law is getting misused. But... That was not ending there. I had physical threats. I was advised by the police to be careful because I could be attacked. I could be intimidated, all these kind of things. And the, some people in the home ministry was helping me. They got intelligence information that since I was in Delhi, the Mumbai police come and arrest me at Delhi without a, a metropolitan magistrate's permission. Therefore, the bishop wants me to be abducted from Delhi to Mumbai oh. and arrested. So they paid the underground mafia for that. So therefore, I should be careful. That's what I was asked. So I moved from my home. I stayed in some friend's house. But still, I appeared on television, spoke about this case, and made it public. And all the media started reporting the whole thing. And I said, I'm going to face this case if I'm not killed. And so 
the Indian media started taking it very seriously. CNN, IBM reported, and French media, Times of India, Hindustan Times, anyway, everybody mm-hmm. reported. And then slowly it caught up in the international media, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and the New York Times, and everywhere it started, BBC, everywhere it started appearing. So then I got another information, again from the government sources only, that one of the, then I was considering the possibility of going to Mumbai to a court and get arrested. Then I'm straightly with the court, not with the police. So this was being planned. And then I get a telephone call, strangely, at midnight. I'm not at home. I'm staying in a secret place to, for my safety. And I get a telephone call on my mobile phone at 12 o'clock in the night. And the person introduces himself as the station house officer, SHO of the Ville Parle police station. I said, why don't you call from a landline during the day, I asked, not from a mobile phone at midnight. He said, I am the police officer. I want to talk to you right now. I said, okay, come on, what do you want? So I have a solution for you. I know that you're running for your life and that will not end up very peacefully because finally you will come to my hands. We have charged the case already. Without, I said, how do you charge the case without taking my statement? Yeah. No, I have absolute right by the law. Even I can claim that for your safety, I want to arrest you. But mm-hmm. once you are with me, I will put you in a prison. And one night is enough. Okay. I'll get a, somebody along with you, smash your head, and he must be a crazy person and we'll take care of him. Or anyway, when you come to me, I'll break your both legs and hands because you try to escape from the police. I said, what are you speaking? See, we are in a civilized country and, uh, and oh. you're speaking to a person who is active in the media, publicly known and the leader of a movement. And how do you handle the common people? I said, see, look, very simple. I want all these things. These are all waiting for you. There is a solution. You make an apology to the bishop. Everything will be over. You have a week's time, mm-hmm. apologize to the bishop, and then the cases are over. So I thought I should make it public. I made it public with the telephone number. And yes, it was true. That was the number of the police officer. And BBC has gone and tried to meet this guy. And he said, I want to arrest him. And that's what I said is not something I would know. I would discuss with you. That is on the BBC radio report also. BBC corresponded all the way to meet this police officer and talk to him. Anyway, so I decided not to go into police and then meantime on, on some on the internet, some web groups started discussing how to get me eliminated. Somebody should kill me or if I go to a court, a mob should attack me and I should not reach the court. So I spoke about it publicly. This is what they are discussing. Then it disappears again. So I was very careful at that time, but I decided to speak to media. AFP contacted me and I gave them an interview at my secret hiding place and they published it worldwide. So BBC took it up, CNN took it up and everywhere it was in the world. So then came a situation that my hiding place was not safe. That was even told by police that we know where are you hiding because we are afraid that you'll be attacked there. So, so then I, I moved to the Jawaharlal Nehru University where I had my research. With the help of a dean, I go to do a hostel room with some students supporting me and I stayed there. So from there, I gave interview to the different journals and she was very active. And then a situation came that it could be very dangerous. Any moment, anything could happen to me. I thought I should go away from India for a couple of months or a couple of weeks so that the dust settles down. And that was my plan. So I had a lecture tour in July in Poland. Uh-huh. I thought that I should go some months early outside India, stay outside, go and have this lecture tour. And meantime, everything will be ready. And then I come back. That was my plan. So, so I you, talked to... What were you teaching in JNU and uh, what was your... Now, I, I studied political science and international relations. I see. Okay. That is where my research is. Where my academic field was international relations. Mm-hmm. And my research was on the theocratic influence of Pakistan's foreign policy with a special reference to India. Whew. Okay. <laughs> That's risky business by itself. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, let's continue with the story. Yeah. Maybe. And then I yeah, tried to talk to friends outside India where to go. Immediately, I wrote to 
sent a for inquiry to Paul Cops. I wrote to a friend in Finland who was the Finnish Humanist Union's president, who was my old friend, 25 years. We have been very close friends and he used to come to Delhi and stayed at my place and I came to Finland. I stayed at his place. Then I wrote to another friend in London, Robert Eagle, who made a documentary about me for Channel 4. So first reply came from London. He said, come over to London. You could stay here. And when things are safe, you can go back. My house is open for you. The third floor where I go, I used to stay there. That's open for you. And he sends an invitation immediately. But the process, my daughter was working in the British High Commission. So I, but it takes five to seven days at least to my passport. My visas were all expired and I have to take fresh visas. So it to take five to seven days to get a British visa because it has to go through a different process. It was outsourced. So then came a letter from Centre for Inquiry offering me a teaching profession at the Centre for Inquiry because that can be the official reason to teach there. Of course, that was being discussed earlier also. That these two options were in my hand. Then came a call from Pekka, who was Education Secretary here. He said, are you still alive? That was the question. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm still alive. <laughs> then... Uh, because the reports were all coming in Finnish newspapers uh, everywhere in the world at that time. And so then he said, can you travel up to the Finnish embassy? He asked. I said, uh, yes, possible. He said, today is Friday. They will close at 12 o'clock. Now it's 11 o'clock for you in India. Can you reach there before 12 o'clock? I said, yes, possible. Okay. So he said, I am driving to somebody very closely connected to the foreign ministry. And you just go there and file an application for a travel to visa meeting me. I said, how would it work like that? He said, just do it. That's what he said. Sure. And uh, I took a friend along with me and I drove to the Finnish embassy and it was 10 minutes to 12 o'clock. As they parked the car in front of the gate, I still remember I mean, the car was towed away late because it was not parked even properly. I rushed inside and uh, told them that I have to file an application for a visa. The lady on the counter said, look, can you do it on Monday? Because I've taken a and <laughs> a leave because my son's birthday is today and I have to go there. So there are calls coming from Finland for your visa. Is it so? I said, it's so important. You will know it later. So I put in the application and maybe two minutes before 12 o'clock, I give insight. To my surprise, after 30 minutes, I get the visa. Wow. And so... I was still sitting with the, I think he was sitting with the foreign minister or something like that. And I go on the visa and the next day morning, I flew to Finland. I could not take any clothes from my home or anything because I knew that I could not go to my home because there could be an assassin waiting for me. That was the situation at that time. And all my dear people were thinking that I would be killed in some days. That was the general feeling. Mm -hmm. And I could not go and say goodbye to my children, for example. Because that would be a dangerous place. Somebody would be waiting for me nearby. I took two close friends, bought a couple of jeans and some basics and went to the airport late in the night. And it was all very easy there. There was no complication. I, I Pekka sent even a ticket. I didn't have to even go for a ticket. He was so friendly, such a great friend. And so everything was ready morning, the 10 o'clock, I think 10 o'clock, the flight would begin. I was inside night, 9 o'clock. Once sitting in the flight, I sent a text message to James Randi because he was campaigning for me so vehemently, wrote at least a dozen articles in support of me and calling support from everybody. And people like Richard Dawkins and James Randi and all, I should be ever thankful in my life because they have been really supporting me. And Richard Dawkins even initiated, became the first signet of a campaign started by the British Rationalist Association, the publishers of New Humanist, in support of me. And Richard was the first person who signed it. And it was a huge campaign. It got thousands and thousands of people signing every day. It was swelling like anything. Mm -hmm. But I texted to James Randi, I'm safe for this moment and I'm going to Finland. I'm in the flight. In mm -hmm. a few seconds, I'll be stopping the phone. So keep, I could not write that he should keep this information safe or should not say publicly. But mm -hmm. he was overwhelmed and by happiness. I closed the phone. When I reached Finland, six hours later, mm -hmm. the whole media was waiting for me there. You know what happened? With James Randi, out of his uh, happiness, he sent out a media article, Sunil is safe. Because there were reports that Sunil is running for his life. 
Uh-huh. In Canada, there was a report that suddenly he's running for his life and what happens to him is not known. So he's a Canadian and living in the United States and he was worried about that. He said, suddenly he's safe and he's going to Finland. He has sent me a text from the aeroplane. And that was taken by a lot of people and sent out by other people. And it was all around in the Twitter. And the next day I was interviewed by the Finnish television. And I was taken very seriously and meetings were there to explain the whole thing here. And I came with a return ticket. And the return ticket was extended two times. And I went to Poland and gave my lectures and came back to Finland again. And I planned to go two times. And the second time when I was planning to go, mm. after discussion with one of my closest friends, who is no more, Narendra Dabolkar in Mumbai. Yes, of course we know him. He planned, he planned my visit to Mumbai. He said, we'll make a human wall around you. You have a lot of people. And you go to court directly and we address the case. I agreed. And after this conversation, I even wrote about that. I may go to India soon. Mm-hmm. Four days later, I get the report that he was shot dead oh. in Mumbai streets. Oh, this was so, so related to this whole incident. Yeah, yeah. And so I cancel my ticket again. Okay, I took a residence permit in Finland because I had changed a teaching assignment. I took along with the Finnish education department in the UNESCO affiliated institutions. And I registered here as a person walking and I remained in Finland. So it's a long story. But uh, it cannot be shortened. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no that, all these details are absolutely necessary. You have been through so much and all for fighting for reason. In fact, I, I'm very proud and happy to be able to say that I, uh, I shook James Randi's hand and thanked him for his work when I went to the uh, CS Icon in, in Vegas in 2018. Oh, mm. And soon after that, he passed away, unfortunately. But yeah, he, that was the last one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. He was supposed to be reckoned with. 2013, the next year after I reached here, James in, invited me to the second conference in Las Vegas. And I was there. That is, again, another thing that I would never forget. I wrote also about his support, calling me, James Randi is my hero. He was so much supporting me and all. And when I was speaking in his conference, he introduced me to the audience as follows. He said, Sanal calls me his hero. <laughs> but if you ask me who is my hero, and that is Sanal, he said. <laughs> and the audience stood up and clapped. And that was the moment I felt that's a kind of recognition, the biggest recognition that I felt I got. Absolutely. And you deserved every bit of it. You've literally, you put your life on the line for reason, basically. I first heard of you, I think, on the Thinking Atheist podcast, which is by Seth Andrews. Oh, yeah. And that was where I first heard of you. And then there were, there have been many other incidences. In fact, I was at the FFRF, which is the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Oh, yeah. Conference. Just this last October, was it? Yeah. Which is in Texas. Yeah. And- interestingly, Dan Barker is coming to Finland. We have a small hybrid seminar on 8th of April. Mm-hmm. Dan is coming and speaking here. Oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah I met <laughs> him as well. And there were so many other people who had, who have not only heard of you, but have also who also speak of you fondly and about everything that you've done. So, but where did your, where did this, this journey towards reason and becoming an activist, where did that start? I was lucky that I was born to non-religious parents, but that, 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 that was not a reason for becoming an activist. I have a sibling, my sister, she's also a non-believer, but she's not an activist. I became an activist because I, I, there was a reason for that. I still remember that when I was 15 years or something like that, we had a neighbor. I, I never met this lady. She was much senior to me, and but she was the sprint queen of Kerala, where we, I was living at that time. The, she was a runner, 100 meters running. She was there. She had a record and she was almost like a celebrity young celebrity in our town. She got a kind of a blood cancer, which needed blood transfusion. Mm-hmm. Her family believed in a kind of a Christian sect that refused blood transfusion of any kind because that was sin. Oh, yes. She I've... could not get it. And that was a big news at that time. She wanted the blood transfusion. The doctors insisted that she they could extend her life for another at least 30 years if that was possible. Later, bone marrow or something like that. But the family refused and she herself refused at the very beginning. 
And finally, she succumbed without taking any medicine, without taking any blood transfusion, and she dies. And that was the time I felt I should be active in fighting these kind of absurdities. And I went to the Rationalist Association's office. My father was one of the pioneers of the Rationalist Movement in Kerala. They said, I want a membership and I become active as a student. So the I still remember the district secretary of the association, my father's friend. He said, the problem is you're only 15 years. The organization, the rule says, I should be 18 years to become a member. That is how the organization is structured. Because adults who can decide for themselves only should become part of the organization. Because they have been, the Rationalist Association has been insisting the stopping of indoctrination on children. So people should be adults when they take real decisions about their life. So I suggested one thing. Shall I go for a student organization instead? So that's your freedom you can do. And I talked to some friends and we started a rationally student movement along with seven or eight friends. And uh, then it got a lot of support in several schools and colleges. It got branches and uh, we started debunking and things that would impress children. It's a kind of a stu- very active student movement that went very well for many more years. And later I became a member of the association and I became an activist almost that time. From very young age, I am active in this movement. And the years I was passionate with this movement, I joined in a kind of a, a diplomatic organization when I was in the university. At a very young age, I became a research officer in the Afro-Asian Rural Development Organization. But my inner call was to do something for rationalism and uh, free thought and skepticism and all. And I after one year, I decided to quit the job. I sent my resignation in and I started a publication house for the promotion of scientific thinking. And I started writing. And around that time, I got elected as the Secretary General of the Indian Rationalist Association. I became the youngest ever general secretary of the organization. Before that, I was in the, in the Delhi State Committee and all. Wow. So cool. that became part of my <laughs> life. <laughs> Wonderful. And what is it that you're doing now? Are you still continuing with your with your teaching? And No more. I'm no more teaching, but I give lectures connected with rationalism. I mean, I, every week I have, I think, three or four Zoom meetings wherein a lot of people are attending from all across the world. And yeah, I still continue in every teaching, but mainly confined to responding to issues that are around uh, free thinking and rationalism and critical inquiry. That's the dream. That's what even I've been trying to get into. I have gotten into now, but it was uh, hearing your story. It makes me think that what was I doing at the age of 15? <laughs> <laughs> because I finally started thinking more critically at around the age of 30, I think it was, hmm. where I suddenly started figuring out that this world is filled with misinformation and I've been believing in it wholeheartedly for most of my life. And it's about time I did something about it and started figuring out my own brain and then eventually figure out, help other people (laughs) come out of their irrational thinking as well. But I hear the kind of spirit that you have. My daughter, who was a head of digital diplomacy in the British High Commission in New Delhi, Mm -hmm. she was a television journalist and eventually she moved to British High Commission. Recently, she was telling me about quitting her job and joining full time in my work. Ah. I was not discouraging her. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think you would, obviously. <laughs> but it can be like, see, the current situation in India is making it so that even my family mm-hmm. are quite concerned about the things that I talk about on my podcast and in the interviews. Because even if I mention the government or the prime minister or anything of that sort, there is a tendency for people to get very agitated. There is a, there is an entire, there's a climate of discomfort and apprehension and even fear that somebody is going to get arrested or made to disappear because speaking out against the government is now taboo pretty much. But there have been a new group of young rationalists and science communicators who have started coming out on YouTube and on on podcasts who are starting to actively talk about not only the political situation, but also about alternative medicines, which is something that has taken off over recent years and has been steadily growing, but tremendously promoted during the COVID pandemic because of the Ministry of Ayush. So there are a 
bunch of bunch of us who are starting to rise up and take notice and are getting a lot of heat for it from some quarters like especially there's a doctor who goes by the liver doc on twitter dr abby phillips who is a biliary specialist he's a biliary researcher and he has been talking against ayurveda for quite a while now and the hate that it has gotten him fortunately nothing threatening to his life it's only in the form of things like youtube comments and social media criticism because i think the more the most of the activists or anti science activists these days are probably mostly residing in social media and they're more armchair activists of that sort so and that is a definite very fortunate uh, thing yeah but on the other side i would not see that this is armchair for use in social media because that's one of the most powerful medium that we have uh, coming to that but i for example when we started speaking about not only ayurveda but homeopathy and all this we have a lot of all this fake medical claims like a pranic healing and this and that we have a lot of things in india yeah you have you know about that so i once had an encounter with a person on a television program who claimed that he has special powers with reiki another healing system that yeah, yeah. and he could g- gain a lot of power with that i brought in i was the i was a resource person for the national science center in delhi and there were a lot of young students studying there my students i brought some of these students in the television studio and tried to replicate everything that he claimed that he would do mm-hmm. like bending a spoon with power children shown how it is done and yeah. or lifting a person with fingers is that reiki power he said come on this is pure physics and the young children of 12 or 13 years they would replicate the whole thing that's still in the youtube again when we speak about ayurveda back in 1980s when we started speaking about ayurveda even rationalists did not take it very kind at the beginning there was a climate in india that what many people understand by rationalism earlier was speaking against religious intolerance absurdities mm. in the faith and all but going beyond that i mean going into the alternative medicines or other paranormal claims or any other things like astrology or this kind of things like astrology on the television again we challenged so powerfully at one time there was even i mean that that i would come but when we spoke about ayurveda and the homeopathy there was so heated attacks coming against me for example sometime back when there was a decision by government of india that ayush doctors ayush is the ayurveda homeopathy unani and all this kind of system which is promoted officially by government by ministry yes exactly. so all of them are going to get a license to practice medicine and i made a very powerful campaign against that and i got hate mail more than when i speak about we just be got oh my god they become intolerant you cannot imagine now. oh i can because the very <laughs> first time i criticized or not criti- i didn't even criticize homeopathy the f- one of the first videos when i was when i just starting out thinking more critically i saw these videos by richard dawkins and by james randi who were talking about homeopathy there's that very famous uh, ted talk by james randi i don't know if it, if it was technically a ted talk but it was definitely a lecture that he was giving where he also, had so there was a test by bbc some somebody claimed that homeopathy could be proved and uh, bbc organized it with the four episodes that was tested so, uh, double blinding test and that's all in the uh, youtube you can get it james randi was the Yeah, he threw of that <laughs> and he was uh, he also kind of led the charge when it came to this there was a french scientist who was doing research on water having memory when it came to certain immune yes. cells <laughs> and uh, yeah. it was published in nature i think it was and james randi was the one who basically tried to replicate those findings and definitely found a lot of flaws and exposed that experiment essentially so but he but when i watched this this talk of his with where he just takes a whole handful of homeopathic sleeping pills yeah <laughs> then he to give the entire lecture and then i think there was an excerpt from a richard dawkins documentary where he explains homeopathy and i've been taking homeopathy for most of my life so when i watched that i was like richard dawkins is otherwise a reliable source and if and it what he's saying does seem to make sense and i then kind of verified it from a few other websites and then i put it up on facebook and i was not expecting the reaction i got it was 
all there were friends of mine who said i i simply had put up a post saying listen this all you fans of homeopathy i think you should watch this video because there's some information here that you'd find very interesting and this i don't remember my exact wording it was, might have been a little bit different from that but the response i got was that i was calling everybody stupid for believing in homeopathy and that it worked and that there were lots of dis different discussions about it worked with my pets and it worked with my children and this infant and worked in my family and on myself etc 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 and i was kind of shocked and later on i published the james randi video and i got a very similar reaction to that so then i started realizing that <laughs> the belief in homeopathy and in alternative medicine almost takes on a religious fervor because i think because it's something that we have all grown up with because we most indian children and maybe a lot of children across the world especially you know in europe in england who have been brought up with these medicines and told that they work and had that confirmation repeated again and again they would obviously it becomes like a childhood indoct indoctrination so there's that religious it becomes a part of their identity that this is that this works and this is a cure all for everything that ails us and therefore if you don't believe in it you're this weird heretic and you should be shunned so i totally uh, I, what you're talking about and it's more yeah, i'll tell you one another example the, one of the former chairpersons of the indian rationalist association dr p m pargava He was the national very reputed molecular scientist and one of the topmost scientists in in India, and he spoke in a public meeting about the absurdity of homeopathy. And he was cornered by some twenty five homeopaths and physically pushed and pulled, and physically abused. Such a reputed scientist, he was something like seventy five years or seventy seven years old, and is it's like religious intolerant fanatics would. attack a person with reason he was physically pulled and pushed and attacked and uh, he had to escape from the place police support imagine that jeez and yeah so this is apparently a very dangerous profession <laughs> but interestingly why in india homeopathy is so important many people think that it's an indian system even there are homeo colleges in india only in kerala there are four homeo colleges in kerala they call it homeo medical college and every year they are churning out 600 graduates medical graduates from the homeo colleges and the homeo colleges is a homeo department mm -hmm. in every state government every state government has a department and central government has a ministry for homeopathy in charge but the homeo colleges are churning out people for your course every year 600 people are coming out as professional homeopaths and many of them it's a profession for them and they have to defend it because they are defending their profession exactly like dr shantanu abhyankar who was one of the first people i ever interviewed for this podcast i met him at sicon in 2018 actually i met him and his family so he had actually studied homeopathy because it seemed like because apparently it's like a back door into the medical profession in india because mm -hmm. at least once you've gone through that you have some basic training in standards of care and you can you can join at more junior positions in a hospital and become like assistants etc but after he'd gone through that he realized what a load of bunk it was and he went back <laughs> studied again reapplied to medical school and finally graduated 7 years later as an md and good so good that he told that story i have a similar story in back in kerala when we started the rationalist student movement you said later mm -hmm. when i became the national general secretary of the indian rationalist association you continue with the rationalist student movement mm -hmm. and uh, one of the activists who came was the union chairman of the homeo medical college in trivandrum so uh, when i heard about his uh, academic background that he is a university chairman in the college we had a long discussion and finally he was very convinced about the whole thing and what was it was very pleasant surprise that he quit his course He didn't want. To, he was on the third year in the Omey Medical College. He was mm -hmm. the union chairman of the college, and he quit his education from there. Wrote the entrance for the modern medical system, modern medical MBS, and he got in, and he became a medical doctor later. Wow! 
That's a very <laughs> big success story. And <laughs> yes, absolutely. And there are others as well who have been who have now been speaking out and speaking against alternative medicine. So I feel that and the fortunate thing is that there is a new generation of rationalists who are kind of growing in numbers and in interest, especially on social media. We feel that it's almost like a tidal wave, that there's nothing that we can do to fight it. It is a tidal wave. Almost all languages, if you see the Hindi scene or Bengali scene or Tamil or Malayalam scene, I mean, there are groups and groups which run on social media, for example, with posts getting something like 40, 50,000 viewers in a week or so. Yeah. I mean, these are the kind of, that's one thing I do when I have these lectures normally on the on on Zoom. After that, these things are re re recorded and put on social media. And mm -hmm. uh, for example, about Ramzan fasting, for example, one I have done last week, mm -hmm. that the medical claims that these people would make, I, I said, come on, I mean, dehydration without taking water is one of the biggest dangers that you're going to do with your health. Absolutely. Because you can, you can fast for two or three days or intermittent fasting, that's a different thing. But stopping drinking water is dangerous to your health. And it's not, nobody would advise that. Nobody who understands anatomy would understand. So this was very, it was not attacking them, but explaining them. But mm. I found sure that in English and Malayalam, it was there. And on my Facebook page, I found four days later, 50,000 viewers. It's amazing. And Malayalam, yes, around something like 45,000 people. I've, I've talked to a small group of 80 people online, but now in a week, I'm actually communicating to 100,000 people in a week. Wow. That's the kind of outreach in social media. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's fantastic. And it, of course, it goes both ways. It can be both used for harm and for good. But oh, that's true. On the other side, social media is full of absurdities and stupidities and baseless. <laughs> that's in circulation. The WhatsApp University is yeah. turning up with a lot of absurd things. And to fight against that is also an important thing. Yeah. Absolutely. I was trying to do that when COVID, when the, during the lockdown and the first lockdown, and I was saturated. I was like, I didn't know where to turn <laughs> because there was so <laughs> much nonsense coming out. And so much of it was generated by the Ministry of Ayush and uh, coming out in the newspapers and in leaflets and in social media posts. On one side, they're debunking some genuinely fake cure and on the other side they're promoting their own fake cure how do they justify that where is the line that they draw it it's very hard to kind of get one's head around but what from of course it must be it's not easy from finland to be able to gauge the situation in india but i'm sure you've been keeping in touch and seeing how things are going so what do you yeah, in of course, I'm on a day-to-day -day basis. I've gone back to the entire moment in India. So, from your perspective, <laughs> how do you think the current situation of religious fanaticism and also pseudoscience? How is that? How is India doing at this point of time, from your perspective? No, pseudoscience has been from different forms. It has been existing early also. I mean, it got new currency with social media taking it forward and spreading it very fast. But uh, for example. Astrology tries to get, they try to make pseudoscientific claims about its veracity, for mm -hmm. example. Homeopathy tries to do the same thing. Every, any, anything that we have, you know, they have, a, they need a sanction or a scientific tag for that. Mm -hmm. Like Ramzan, for example. Ramzan is a fasting just because of religious reasons. But exactly. they want a sci scientific tag for it. It's good for your health. Scientifically proven. So this scientific tag is what everybody is seeking now. So this is the most dangerous thing. Pseudoscience get more and more propagated because oh, everybody is seeking a kind of scientific tag. So they want to make scientific, scientific looking words and credibility and all this. Yeah, and to try to establish credibility. That's something we have to systematically fight continuously. And on the other side, the first time ever, now India has a na national level ministry for promoting all these unsubstantiated medical systems. Exactly. Almost That's everything it. in one go. Yeah, from Ayurveda to Sita to uh, all, almost all these kind of things are packed into something and that's officially promoted. Funds are allotted to state governments to promote that. And that is something officially promoting superstition. Exactly. Earlier, astrology was wrote as a subject in universities and 23 universities, astrology is still a subject to study. And uh, these all are things to be fought continuously. There is no other way than fighting it out and exposing it and bringing the scientific community and 
more and more people who understand science, more than only scientists, but the public understanding of science has to grow and the scientific literacy has to grow and get more and more people engaged in the process of rectifying and correcting. That's a, a process which we have to continue for several more decades to come. It's a continuous process. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like a, the Hydra. <laughs> you cut off one hand. Uh, one exactly. And another head will come up and another head. And I mean, another yeah. head will come up at the same time. It's like a Sisyphus work sometimes one would feel, but it is not. I mean, that if you don't do that, imagine then what would be the situation. With all this effort that we all are putting, you are doing there and everybody's, a lot of people, thousands of people are actively contributing to the process of scientific communication and, uh, I mean, spreading reason. But still, we know how hard it is. But imagine if we are not there and yeah. what would be the tide otherwise? Exactly. So this yeah. is an important work that we are doing and it's a message that everybody should take very seriously that a part of their time, even if they are in any other profession, if they are convinced that this is to be addressed properly, at least an hour if they can. I mean, since social media is very powerful, I would suggest that instead of... Uh, uh, of course, there's, it's like a monster coming, a lot of absurdities, but we have to fight it out. We have to encourage more and more people to use at least a little time on social media, to use sensible language to address these things and reach out to people. Absolutely. That's a big, it's a challenge and a big opportunity also. Indeed. So what kind of, what advice would you give to this new generation of uh, skeptic activists, of atheist activists? who are now getting on social media and starting this conversation, what would be the advice that you would give to them? Recently, I had a meeting of the young activists in India who are on social media. Some 300 people were attending that, where I suggested the only thing. Whatever profession you are, many of them are active for some day. Then they get into some profession and they, they, have, they attain and gain a lot of experience. They study a lot of things, but that's in a way get dormant when they get into professions and later move away. But that's the most important thing that I suggest. Young people, especially in the universities and in search of professions at this moment, if they are active now, when they go into professions, when they go into the real challenges of life, don't get absorbed into that. Spend a little time every day to mm. continue what they have been doing because this has to be taken forward. It should not end up like a youth and enthusiasm in your youth, but it should continue over the years. And that would encourage a lot of young people again coming up and swelling the big campaign, which would finally tide this away. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And a lot of the content that you create these days is in Malayalam, I assume? No. Malayalam, I, that's my mother tongue. So there's yeah. a huge audience waiting for me in Malayalam. There's a huge pressure to respond to issues in Malayalam. I, of course, I produce at least two or three pieces in English also every week, every mm -hmm. week, okay. but maybe 10 pieces in Malayalam parallelly. Because I, I spent really a lot of time on communicating to people and we are running three or four websites. There is a new application app we made, Rationalist, that's oh. downloadable on, on both for Android as well as for iOS system. And th thereby we are trying to connect all people all across. And every event that we are making is hybrid now because pe people have studied a lot to use the social media. For example, eight, we have a conference here in uh, Helsinki, but it's a hybrid conference. We are expecting some people to attend here, but mm. expecting some thousand people to attend from across the world. This is how we are doing. So we, what, what we generally tell all these young people who are in the moment to get more and more people active, but also to use civilized language. That's very important. Social media has a trend to use, for example, trolling. Oh, they, they, yeah. Trolling sometimes can coil back. Mm. Trolling is making a joke only. You, yeah, exactly. you know, you, 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 yeah, you make a joke, it may be good initially, but mm. if you continue trolling only, that doesn't yeah. give anything productive. Instead, you should use small units of communication which can explain things. That mm. would be more, it will have more outreach. It doesn't mean that we should stop trolling, but trolling this way and that way and use harsh language is not the way. It's not to hurt people, but to explain them, helping them to open up and coming out. That's how we should do. What I feel is that back in 1995, I had a trip in India. 18 months we have been on the roads, starting from Kanyakumari to New Delhi. And we traveled with 18 people, talked in small meetings, 300 people in a 
or 200 people in all little meetings. And every day, maybe 20 meetings. And that is what BBC has made a documentary about. It's uh, available online, Guru Bus Days. Oh, yes. And, uh, what Guru Bus Days? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, you can see a young me at that time, I mean, speaking in meetings and going on. But in that trip in 18 months, we could talk to very proudly. <clears throat> we thought I could talk to a million people in 18 months. But now I talk to a million people every week. That, that became possible. That yeah. became possible because the social media has opened up new avenues. And I encourage a lot of people, the team that I have, I'm not doing it all alone. I have people supporting me from different parts. And somebody is sitting in London, somebody is sitting in New Delhi, and all these people are together. We all are collectively doing. There is a team of something like 22 people in this production team that we have. And we are continuously producing stuff and producing new tools like, like the app we developed. We are going to have apps in different Indian language. This is in English what we have written, the rational app, but it should be uh, soon coming in Hindi, in Bangla. These are the two languages we are thinking immediately to also to make it in French and German. So this is, these are the kind of things we are planning now. And a youth camp is planned in this summer to the, the encourage the European youth. That's another interesting point. In Europe, many people think that we all have become scientific. Oh, there is oh, nothing oh. to be done. But instead, the reality is that the, the, all these pseudosciences are coming in a big wave in different places. Oh, in Norway, oh. we have a, somebody in the royal family speaking about going to... She, she was married to a shaman and, uh, who would do magic. And all these kind of things are getting even in, in Nordic countries. So oh. how many people would show, believe in God? People would say very less number of people, but how many people would believe in angels? <laughs> the number will go up because new superstitions emerge, new kind of images emerge, and we have to keep on continuously developing the critical mindset, promoting. Instead of explaining these things, what we require is getting the critical mindset. Hmm. That's the most important thing. That's where we have to focus. That's what the youth camp which we are planning also is targeting. Yeah, because when I was coming back from this last trip to from Saikon and at the FFRF, I was sitting next to a European lady. I don't remember sh where she was from. It maybe Germany. But then I mentioned what what we were doing and the kind of things we were thinking about and talking about at the conferences, and I just spoke about it in passing. And from then on, the entire conversation started revolving around all the things that she believed that, that you know, about ketogenic diets, about homeopathy, about all sorts of things. Then I was like, wow, like Europe. I said, do a lot of your friends do this as well? She's like, yeah, they, this lady, this friend of mine is doing a juice fast and this lady is doing a water fast. And I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> even Europe is yeah. not into this. Yes, yeah. a lot of superstitions around. But that doesn't mean that it has gone completely in a crazy direction. But there are tendencies. Yes. If you look at the people who are going into astrology, is still very popular in Europe, even in Baltic countries, where I mean, religion is no almost no, nowhere existing. But the number of people believing in astrology is something like eight to nine percent. Wow! In Finland, there was a channel, television channel. For astrology, a private television channel, because there is freedom of expression and if people can say without any control. So there yeah. was an astrology channel with astrologers claiming very absurd things. But somehow if there was an interference and that channel is closed down last year. Thank goodness. But yeah, the, there's nobody is immune to it. And we are all subjected to the same kind of influences from social media. And there's so much pseudoscience being promoted in health and so many other fields nowadays. Like even grounding, walking barefoot across the earth to be able to heal yourself of all sorts of things. So we're all doing our part to fight that. So the people who are watching here who would probably be interested in becoming a part of your organization, of your movement, where can they find you? Where can they attend the meetings, etc., etc.? Yeah, the best way, the easiest way to connect would be download the app. Then you get all the information and uh, it's a free app. There is no cost to download it and use it. And there is no advertisement also. It's absolutely free, of course. Mm -hmm. The app is Rationalist. It's a blue colored square with the white letters Rationalist that's available on, on, on both the systems and download it. And then one gets all updates and information, not only the Rationalist International events. What we try to do is beyond 
an organization. We try to promote the whole movement. And we also try to not to limit to, we have several brands, like some people would like to call them self atheists, some people want to call them rationalists, some people, oh, all historic reasons. Some people want to call them humanists, I have mean, different names. But at the end of the day, this is only some difference in distressing. It's all the same. We all are on one side of the fence on the scientific side. So we try to absorb the whole thing. So any event, anybody wants to report about it, announce it, that's all published free of cost in this app. So we try to become a carrier of not only our work, but everybody in the field should be able to use this facility, which we developed over a year. We took one year, whole year to develop this app, but it's available for everybody. Just use it, download it, use it, get information, not only about us and our work, but also of other people's work who are in the field. Wonderful. I'm definitely downloading it and I'll put the links in the description as usual. But also Richard Saunders from the Australian Skeptics community. He's one of the honorary associates of Rationalist International. Oh, wonderful. Because I had him on the show. <laughs> I've been on his podcast as well several times. And he's the one who told me about Guru Busters. This is before I even heard about you. So I watched Guru Busters. There's only apparently, I've tried looking for it on YouTube. There are only segments, like short segments of it, which Mr. Eagle has published. I, in fact, I even emailed Mr. Eagle and said, please, we need to have it out in the open. We need to have easy access to it. Can you tell BBC to put it up somewhere to be able to watch it on streaming or something of that sort? He said, we are not doing it anymore. But if you want, here's a link. You can order DVDs and then whatever. Eagle and Eagle is providing the DVDs of it. Yeah. So, which is, which I've already got the unfortunately pirated version, but I will buy the DVDs for sure. <laughs> and I think like, I we honestly, we should do a show like that now because I, my appeal to Mr. Eagle was that in India, we need this now more than ever because a, even though it was <laughs> a fantastic show and it's still relevant today, but having something which has a more current vibe to it, which the youth can connect to, that places where the youth are familiar with and with people who they are familiar with, like Sadhguru and these yeah, yeah. kind of <laughs> personalities. Robert Eagle has retired from television production. He is now for handling uh, paintings. He's a collector of paintings and he's a major person in the London painting scene now. Oh, I see. But uh, he is, uh, together with Robert Eagle, he's a very close personal friend of me. I mean, the person who has asked me to come to London at that time and stay at his home as Robert Eagle only. A very great friend. Together, we established a small company in London to expand our activities in London also. He and me together founded a small company to promote literature based in London also, which also would start publishing a lot of new books. Ah, wonderful. I hope I hope we can do this in Busters 2 or something like that because we need it. We, if we work together, maybe we can cook up some idea at some point. Of yeah, time. that's something. We have to go more and more into the production that would reach people I mean, without actually physically people going and speaking. Like using all the possible video possibilities or visual possibilities that are opened up now. And we have to use it. More production and more outreach. That's the way. Exactly. And all of us has to pull together and do our own bit. In Absolutely. Pieces to be able to get that message across. Thank you so much, Sanal, for coming on to Rationable Interviews. It has been absolutely de delightful and it's been fascinating hearing your story and also kind of scary. So <laughs> I don't... There I is mean, nothing to be... Of course, I, if I wanted to stop things and I wanted to live a peaceful life, there were a lot of opportunities for me. I decided very clearly my path. And I'm not I, I regretful about that. I'm very confident that I might have taken the correct lines all the time. There was a one, one another small thing. I mean, 2014, my mother was ill and she was dying. I mean, I was very close with my mother and uh, my father died some years back and she was connected to me so closely. And uh, we have been talking regularly and she was in hospital, pneumonia, and she was going down. She was 80 plus. And the doctors said, my friends were there, that she may not survive long. So I was informed. So I thought somehow I should go and meet her. That was my feeling and hold her hand and see her goodbye with my hand in her hand. Of course. And I talked to somebody in the Catholic Church in Mumbai and I tried to make, since I studied political science and international relations, I thought of a kind of a truce for some days 
a white flag for some times. Don't trouble me. I'm going to come to India, but I would be seeing my mother and returning back. But don't make any trouble when I'm in India. Don't try to send people against me. But this should be a gentleman's agreement because my mother is dying. This is the message I sent to them with through a trusted friend inside. I was told that the Archbishop of Mumbai will respond to me. The Archbishop earlier wrote publicly on his website that I should apologize. The whole trouble will be over. I should apologize only. I said, bring all the torture machines from medieval times, but you don't get my apology. That is what I replied at the time. Wow. Here again, he said, and the person in the church informed me that we don't want to make any trouble for you. And then we are very kind about these kind of situations. We will stop all trouble that we... Officially, they say that they didn't make any trouble. But here they say that they would stop everything, all cases and everything will be withdrawn. But I should make a private apology to the church. Oh. <laughs> and what was my... I told my sister about this. My sister communicated this to the mother. And the mother told her, do you think he would apologize and come to see me? She asked my sister. My sister said, I do not know. He loves you so much. I don't know. But I don't think he should do it. He will not do it. But if he apologizes for seeing me, and if he comes for that, don't open the door for him. Pause it for him. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, my goodness. That, that is, that, uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And two, two days later, she dies. I didn't apologize, of course. I immediately said that I don't want to see my mother with your mercy. And I, don't, I would never apologize because I have not done anything wrong. I would keep on saying it repeatedly till my last breath. <laughs> that is so inspiring and so powerful. I can't even begin to imagine that kind of... You've, you're made of very stern stuff, sir. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> and you're an inspiration for us all and especially for the new generation of skeptics in this country. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we'll have you on another time. And thank you so much for giving your time. I uh, give us Wonderful. all blessings. <laughs> Big pardon. Bling, give us all your blessings. So to <laughs> come on. Well, wonderful that you are doing this work. What you are doing, I'm connecting the younger people in the moment together, and I'm using the social media is something really appreciable, and I really appreciate your effort. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So much, and I'm trying to connect people from all around the world. So, with my connections at Psycon, with my connections with Richard Saunders. And uh, I had dinner with Richard Dawkins and met Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I've, having gone to that extent, I want to make skepticism something that is not just a US thing or an Indian thing, or it's isolated in different countries, but I want to be able to connect everybody together to kind of have a collective mind yeah. towards having civil discussions towards reason. So, uh, but thank you very much. This has been thoroughly enlightening and very fascinating. And I am so honored to be able to speak to you and you're an inspiration to us all. Thank you so much. Thank you and nice meeting you. We'll meet again. Yeah. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. And if I ever come down to Finland, I'm definitely dropping in. Do come. <laughs> <laughs> and for everybody watching, thank you so much for joining us. And this has been Rationable Interviews with, and it's been an absolutely amazing journey. Please give this video a like, subscribe to this channel if you want more amazing interviews like this. And we'll see you in the next one. Until then, stay rationable. See you soon.